Hello everybody, my name is Paul Beasley Murray. Fifty years ago this October I was ordained to Christian ministry and now to my amazement fifty years later I'm celebrating the 50th anniversary of my ordination. It's been quite a ride. I began my ministry as a missionary. Yes, within three days of my ordination I was off on the high seas for Congo. And for two years I taught Greek and New Testament to men who come from all over Congo to the Protestant theological faculty of what later became the National University. The next 13 years were spent as a pastor in Altrincham, Cheshire, a town that has a football club that never ever makes it quite to the league. There I was pastor of the local Baptist church. When I arrived it was a declining church with some 83 members but by the time I left in 1986 the church had quadrupled in size and was an amazingly exciting place to be. From Altrincham we moved to London where I became a college principal. At the time Spurgeon's College was in the doldrums and my task was to turn the college's fortunes around and with God's help we did. My heart however remained in the local church. But as a good Baptist, I believe that the local church is the cutting edge of the kingdom. So in 1993, I became a pastor again and accepted the call to Chelmsford, Essex. And yet again, my task was to turn an institution around which was stuck in the past. I stayed there for 21 years. By the time we left the church, we had some 400 committed members with a church family of around a thousand. And it too was a great place to be. In 2014 I retired from stipendiary ministry and since then I see myself as a minister at large with a base in Chelmsford Cathedral. In the last six years I've written some seven books, the latest of which is 50 Lessons in Ministry. Reflections After 50 Years of Ministry, published by DLT this September. Do you like the colour? I do. I'm a Cambridge man, hence my preference for light blue. I spent four happy years at Jesus Cambridge. Do you like the picture? The jug, the bowl and the towel point to the upper room where Jesus washed his disciples' feet and said, I have set you an example. Jesus calls us to the ministry of the towel, that is, to servant leadership which focuses on the people to be cared for rather than just the job to be done. Servant leaders cannot trample on people even in pursuit of the kingdom. And do you like the title? 50 Lessons in Ministry. One of the things I've enjoyed throughout my ministry is rising to the challenge of learning new ways of serving God and his people. Interestingly, it was this aspect which Stephen Cottrell, the new Archbishop of York, highlighted in his commendation of my book. He wrote, John Henry Newman famously said that to grow is to change and to have become perfect is to have changed often. Paul Beasley Murray may not be perfect, goodness gracious, but he has changed and he is gloriously open to change. It is this constant learning and probing that makes his reflections on a lifetime of ministry so encouraging and helpful. So 50 lessons in ministry. Today I want to single out just five. First of all, names are important. One of the most fascinating chapters in the New Testament is Romans 16. Yet at first sight it seems to be the most boring of chapters because it's largely a list of names. Here Paul greets 26 individuals by name. Of what possible interest, some might say, can this chapter be? Yet in many ways it's a highly instructive in chapter. For instance, of the 26 named individuals, 9 are women and 17 are men. But more women than men are commended for being active at the church. What has changed, you might ask? 
Furthermore, only three of the 26 can be positively identified as Jews. 14 appear not to have been born in Rome itself and were perhaps immigrants. And a study of the names also shows that two-thirds of those mentioned were probably slaves. The church in Rome was an amazing cultural mix. And there's another important aspect to this list. Even though Paul had yet to visit the church in Rome, he knew 26 people by name. I wonder, did Paul know the significance of greeting people by name? Did he know how powerful it is? According to Dale Carnegie, a person's name is to him or her the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Similarly, Joyce Russell, an American business coach, wrote, a person's name is the greatest connection to their own identity and individuality. Some might say it is the most important word in the world to that person. You see, to greet people by name is to show that we value them, that they count. And for me, one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible is John 10.3, where Jesus says that the Good Shepherd knows his own sheep by name. What a difference those words make to me. Whereas agencies such as the National Health Service and Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs know me primarily as a number, Jesus knows me by name. He loves me. He values me. In turn, we too are called to love one another and value one another by knowing one another by name. Now you might say that's fine in a small church with a dozen people, but in our church with 120 people, that's impossible. I disagree. I'm convinced that when English people say that they have a bad memory for names, by and large they're not telling the truth. What in effect they're saying is, I can't be bothered, I'm too lazy. And the proof of this is to compare English people with Americans. It's rare for an American to forget a person's name. For in an American culture, knowing a person's name is important. And so Americans tend to make a real effort to know one another's names. It's not that they are any cleverer than us. It's just that they are more determined. How many names can we expect to know? I think without too much effort, probably most people could remember at least 150 people by name. But with application, we can know many more. Indeed, I read of an American megachurch pastor who claimed to know all 16,000 of his members by name. What's the secret? Probably in the first place by showing more interest in the people we meet. The fact is that names are important for people are important. Lesson number two. People need to be affirmed constantly. In my early ministry, I had a short exchange pastorate in Peachtree Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. And there I experienced affirmation in overdrive. At the end of the service, people would come up to me at the church door and tell me what a mighty fine preacher I was. And one Sunday evening, I just had enough of this. So instead of going to the door, I just stood by the pulpit and they all lined up at the pulpit to tell me what a mighty fine preacher I was. It just all seemed too unreal. Still, at least those expressions of praise were better than a gift I received at a staff Christmas lunch, where Secret Santa gave me a collection of 365 pick-me-ups to help me have a really great day. So, on January the 1st, I decided to give this compliment a day a try. It proved impossible. Day one, it said, you're on top of things. Day two, you are so in control of things today, it's uncanny. Day three, you'd better know how to take a compliment, because the way you look today, they're going to come thick and fast. 
Day four, you're just brimming with confidence today. Day five, today, only the sky's the limit. Day six, you're just the bee's knees. Day seven, damn, you look like sex on legs. Well, I quickly gave up on this pad of pick-me-ups. It was all too pseudo and, of course, so untrue. There's a place for affirmation, but not for make-believe and self-adulation. By contrast with our distant American cousins who major on positivity, we Brits tend to be critical of the achievements of others. One expression of this is the tall poppy syndrome in which we put down people who've done well. We, as it were, cut down the tallest poppies in the field so that they are the same size of others. But that's often untrue and unfair and born out of envy. By contrast, Margaret Thatcher explained her political philosophy to an American audience as let your poppies grow tall. And that's a much more positive approach to life. Although on reflection, perhaps we shouldn't just talk about letting our poppies grow tall. In view of the diversity of people's gifts, maybe we should recognise not just the poppies, but the roses and the tulips and the other beautiful flowers too. Yes, we need to affirm the talents and achievements of others. I shall never forget my first experience of Spring Harvest, the Easter holiday Bible teaching event, where I had been invited to be one of the speakers. On the first full day, there was a meeting of speakers and helpers, at which we were challenged to major on the positive. And we were told that instead of being critical about the sessions, we had to find something positive to say about one another. And amazingly, this is what happened. And by the end of the week, I seemed to be walking on air. It was a wonderfully affirming experience. Precisely because affirmation makes such a difference, when I later came to draw up a team covenant for my staff, one of the practices I encouraged was positivity. I said, in our relationships with one another, and indeed with the rest of the church, we will always exude a positive spirit. We will shun negative talking and thinking. We will instead affirm one another and speak well of one another. I had learnt that if we want to get the best from people, then appreciation is what is required. According to William James, the deepest principle on human nature is the craving to be appreciated. We all have our ups and downs. What a difference a word of encouragement then makes. And certainly I believe that if we are to motivate volunteers, then we need to affirm them. And in this regard, it's not enough just to write a thank you note to people who helped at a church event. Good leaders will also say how much they appreciated the help that was given and what a difference that help has made. And even better, good leaders will express their appreciation publicly. What a difference it makes when ministers publicly praise members of their congregation for their achievements, rather than themselves take the credit for what has happened. Lesson number three. Leadership demands passion. Hegel, the great German philosopher, once said, nothing great in the world has been accomplished without passion. Passion it is that gives leaders energy and attracts people to follow their lead. Passion enables us to influence others. In the New Testament, the term passion tends to be used of unhealthy, sinful sexual urges and therefore has negative connotations. However, in two places, both Paul and Peter recognise there's a place for passionate leadership. Romans 12.11, for instance, Paul wrote, Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. In other words, if we are to serve the Lord, ministers must be on fire for Jesus. They must be passionate. 
And in 1 Peter 5, 2, Peter said to a group of leaders, Tend the flock of God, not for sordid gain, but eagerly, passionately. Kenneth Bailey wrote, The shepherds should lead their flocks eagerly and passionately. Peter was passionate about many things. He wanted the shepherds of God's new flock to engage in leading his sheep with that same enthusiasm. Passion for the gospel was of utmost importance. My New Zealand friend Terry Kalkin says that there are three levels implied in the English word passion. The first is deep excitement. This, he says, is the contagion of leadership. This is what makes other people want to follow the leader. Secondly, it implies deep desire. This is the element of passion that keeps the leaders committed to their objective, even when the going gets tough. And thirdly, it includes the idea of deep suffering. For instance, when we talk about the passion of Christ, we talk of the suffering of Christ, not least in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. In other words, in a Christian context, passion is ultimately cruciform in shape. Yes, in leadership, passion is vital, for it's passion which communicates vision. Vision needs passion, passion needs vision. Vision gives direction to passion. Passion motivates vision. To quote my friend Terry Kalkin again, Vision comes from God. Passion comes from you. When passion and vision mix, you have fulfilment. If you have vision without passion, you have a daydreamer. If you have passion without vision, you have a wheel spinner. All action and nowhere to go. Passion is vital to leadership. Lesson number four. Every church is different. Well, that, of course, is to state the blindingly obvious. We don't have to go even further than the pages of the New Testament to see that. The church at Jerusalem was very different from the church at Corinth, and the church in Ephesus was very different from the churches of Galatia. And similarly, the seven churches in the book of Revelation all had their own distinctive character. <clears throat> what was true in the first century remains true in the 21st century. And here I don't have in mind the vast array of theological and ecclesiological differences, but rather the differences that exist within the same denomination or wing of the church. Differences which have their roots in different experiences and histories. An analysis of the congregational dynamics of any given church involved eight different perspectives. Personal faith stories, interpersonal networks and connections, numerical data, shared congregational history, surrounding community, the spouse and operant theology, congregational dynamics and oneself as leader. Yes, every church has its own distinctive DNA. And the result is that something that has been tried and tested in one situation with good effect may not be appropriate in another situation. The style of mission and ministry at Saddleback or at Willow Creek or at HTB or at All Souls Langham Place cannot be transferred lock, stock and barrel elsewhere. The fact is that God is not in the business of cloning, and rightly so. Apart from anything else, every location is different. The needs and challenges of suburbia are very different from the needs and challenges of the inner city or of a large housing estate. Having said that, this doesn't mean that ministers and churches cannot learn from one another. Proverbs 18.15 we read, intelligent people are always and eager and ready to learn. Words which the Living Bible translates as the intelligent man is always open to new ideas. In fact, he looks for them. 
Incidentally, it's not only the churches which are different, ministers too are different. They have different gifts and abilities. One might, might be more of a pastor. Another might be more of an evangelist or a community leader. And precisely because of those different gifts and abilities, our callings may be very different from our predecessors or indeed our successors. The wise church, instead of comparing one minister with another, will welcome the different styles and approaches offered to them by their successive ministers. And it's not just churches which compare one minister with one another. Ministers do this too. I've discovered that one of the temptations of ministry is to constantly compare oneself with other ministers and the process become envious of others and of the way in which God appears to be blessing others. I've learnt that we need to focus on Jesus and not on others. In this regard we need to take notice of the rebuke Peter received after Jesus had said the day would come when, and I quote, someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not want to go. John tells us that Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved and he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus declared, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Our business is to follow Jesus and to fulfill our particular calling, not to be concerned with anybody else. And lesson number five. Retirement marks a new stage in ministry. I confess that at first I struggled to call myself retired. It seems to be such a negative word. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, to retire means to withdraw, to retreat, to give ground, to cease to compete. Yet, I've discovered is also about new beginnings and new opportunities. A poem which sums up my experience of retirement is The Terminus, written by David Adam, the former vicar of the holy island of Lindisfarne. The terminus is not where we stay. It is the beginning of a new journey. It is where we reach out beyond, where we experience new adventures. It's where we get off to enter new territory, to explore new horizons, to extend our whole being. It is a place touching the future. It opens up new vistas. It is the gateway to eternity. Although very much a new stage in life for me, I've discovered that it is not the end of ministry. Rather, retirement simply marks a new stage in ministry. Louis Armstrong, the great jazz musician, once said, Musicians don't retire, they stop when there's no more music in them. And that too is how most retired ministers feel. We still have divine music in our souls, and we'll only stop giving voice to that music when we join the greater chorus in heaven. True, we no longer have a church to run and should let go of any desire to do so. Retirement is about letting go and in entrusting the church to the Lord of the church. In this regard, I found the comment from an Anglican perspective most, un most helpful, that priests never retire, but vicars do. They relinquish jobs, but not their vocations. Although Baptists don't refer to their ministers as priests, I find the use of this term priest nonetheless meaningful. For a priest, by definition, is a bridge between God and the world. The Latin word for priest, pontifex, literally means a bridge builder. And I believe that part of my ongoing calling is building bridges between God and others. Now precisely how we do that in our retirement varies from one person to another. For me, living out the call includes writing a weekly blog, Church Matters, 
Every week I receive responses from all over the world. It's almost like having a virtual congregation, except that blogs take the place of sermons and people don't tend to grumble. I recognise that one day, unless God takes me early, I'll make the transition from the third age of active retirement to the fourth age of dependency. Then the challenge will be for me to live out my call not by what I do, but by the way I live. For instance, when illness strikes and death perhaps looms, what will, be, what will count will be my witness of courage and faith. Yes, even at the end, I believe that God will still have a call on my life. Nothing beats sitting on it, hearing it, tasting it, wearing it, handling it, trying it, comparing it. The copier produces a thousand copies for four pounds. The Riso Digital Printer produces a thousand copies for one pound twenty at 140 pages per minute. Discussing it. The interesting thing about this centre is a very difficult breed on a very small site. Buying it. Recommending it. I definitely recommend it. It's always good to have resources. And yeah, this is very resourceful, so it's a great place to be. Nothing beats being here. Buy your tickets online now. CREonline.co.uk forward slash tickets.